Take your seats, please. Take your seats. Next presentation by returning guest, Dean Wesley Smith. Is this working? I, you hear me all right? I guess uh, I can now take off the branding. Because <laughs> this is what I do in all my author pictures is this look. And so it's just way too hot here to where you're wearing this crap. So, so much for the branding. Now nobody will recognize me. That's the attitude. All right, I'm here under incredibly bright lights. I bet you guys have heard that all day. Um, I can't see anything anyhow, so. Um, gonna talk about attitude. Now, attitude for a writer. This is probably one of the areas that I'm known for because I teach it a lot. Um, those of you who don't know who I am, I've been doing this for, well, I sold my first short story in 1974 before many of you were born. And um, I started making a living at this in 87. And from 87 on, um, I have worked in publishing. I worked in publishing before that, but I wasn't making a full living at it. I had to 10 bar. Um, so from 1987 on, I have been a full time in the profession. Um, I have about 200 novels and five or 600 short stories out. Um, unbelievable number of other books and, you know, not that many collections yet, which is weird. I just haven't got to it. Um, and the, um, basically the, the thing that when you've been around 40 years, like my wife who talked this morning, Christine Catherine Rush is my wife. Um, we've been around for 40 years doing this silliness and making a living at it. And one of the things that we notice more than anything else is attitude. It's attitude. It is, it's, we have seen so many good friends, people we knew, acquaintances, people we saw from a distance, flash in and disappear. And we call them whatever happened to's. <laughs> whatever happened to John? You know, whatever happened to Bill out there? You know, God, he was doing so well. He had all these books. Now, remember when we came in, it was traditional publishing only. Traditional publishing back in the 80s when I sold my first novel and in the 90s was a different world than the traditional publishing now. Traditional publishing now, they want all rights, they don't give your books back, anything else. Back then, it, basically we were licensing to traditional publishing and we got most of our books back. I also did a lot of media for a long time. I'm probably known more than anything else as a Star Trek writer. I have written more Star Trek books under many names um, than any other writer in history. I have 35 of them. Although there's a writer by the name of Dayton Ward that's going crazy right now and he's catching me. Um, I'm not going to stay ahead of him either. I'm done uh, writing Star Trek. But I loved it. I loved it. I wrote Men in Black. I wrote Men in Black novels. Um, I wrote gaming. Um, I have about 23, 24 million copies of my books in print. And so, again, a lot of that has to do with just being around for a long time. And being around for a long time is an attitude. It truly, truly, truly is an attitude. Um, and so I'm going to go here and, and give you what I consider, and Chris looked this over and said, ah, and added one, um, one that I had forgotten. Um, but uh, I'm going to go over nine points here that are towards writer attitude and that I hope will help you go forward. And I am going to, apologies, guys, who run the conference, probably go against some of the other stuff you've been hearing. But again, I've been here for 40 years doing this. I make enormous amounts of money, okay? <laughs> WM, I didn't mean to, it just sort of happened. You know, when you write a lot of stuff for a lot of years, that's, um, that thing just happens. And one of the aspects about this is that I am, my friends call me a curmudgeon in so many ways. Because I'm just like, why the hell would I do that? No, I'd rather be writing. I'd rather be doing this or that. So um, Scott Carter, a friend of mine, Scott William Carter, great writer, um, has a test that many of you have probably heard called the Wibbo test. W-I-B-B-O-W, Wibbo. Would I be better off writing? Wibbo. 
tell you, when you think about doing something and you think, would I be better off writing? Apply the Wibbo test. It's from Scott Carter. Has nothing to do with this, but it's a good attitude thing. So, number one, let me tell you exactly how I started. Sustainability. It never occurred to me to think about this when I started off. Um, I was doing absolutely nothing that went towards sustainability when I was starting. I was doing everything wrong. I wasn't having fun. I was just completely, completely buying in to every myth in writing that there was. Every myth. I bought it. Hook, line, and sinker. And I talked about that some last year. But um, sustainability is sort of like a keynote phrase. That's number one. Just everything I'm going to say with the rest of these points, just attach it back to sustainability. Is Look at what you're doing right now. Is it sustainable five years from now? Is it sustainable 10 years from now? I know early writers, oh my god, we're all in a hurry. I was no exception to that rule. I was in an awful hurry. I wanted it now. I mean, I was an old guy when I started. I was 32 years old. I was, I was, it was passing me by. You know, that's just funny now. I look back on it um, because now I'm 69 years old, but I'm 32, my God, when I really started writing. Um, and I just was like, oh, I gotta be in a hurry. I gotta be in a hurry. It's too late. No, it's just silly. Um, so sustainability. Will what you're doing right now last? Could you do it for five straight years? If the answer is no, uh-oh. <laughs> That's simply uh-oh. You really, really, really need to be changing um, and go towards sustainability. Okay, so that's bedrock post number one, point number one. Point number two, if you guys ever write me, and a lot of you have written me, and because we, we do workshops, um, WMG publishing workshops, um, we do a lot of them. We didn't mean to do a lot of them. They're online. We also do four here in town. Um, therefore, advanced, more advanced writers, although the ones online are for beginning writers. Um, and they, I, you, you'll get from me always the have fun. That is truly, truly. I mean, all of you who are looking at, you know, and, and old, when I came in, the old pros were, that were my mentors, and I was very lucky to have a lot of them. Um, they, you know, were always annoyed because the beginning writers, and I probably, again, was no exception to this, are always looking for the secret, the secret handshake, the secret to this. How do you write a secret? What's the secret to writing a short story? Well, I'll tell you the secret, and it's one simple word. Two simple words, have fun. That's number two, have fun. If what you're doing is not fun, back to point one, it's not sustainable. You will stop. If you're calling your writing a job, okay, I don't know about you guys, but I was born very poor. I grew up in a lower, low, low income family that was, you know, my, my mom worked, my dad worked, and making the bills every month was just by gosh and by golly. And my mom was a sharer, so from the minute I was like three years old, I was worried about money too. And, you know, and just <laughs> one of those things that, you know, she couldn't talk to my dad, so she talked to me. I don't know. It was one of those ways you grow up, and you grow up poor, you know, dead poor. And, uh, and so work was what you did when you left the house, that you didn't want to have to leave the house, that you worked your hours, then you came home and you look forward to the weekend and maybe a vacation. That was work, with the big air quotes, work. And it was hated. Yeah, you didn't want to do that, you didn't want to do that. And, and I always looked at that and went, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that with my life. Now, I've had some jobs where I didn't want to go to early on in writing. We all have to work day jobs. And I had them too. But I tried to do the jobs that would feed the writing. Now, I have a master's in architecture and three years of law school. Okay? So, been to college, bought that road, went down that ticket. And, you know, but the reality is I never, well, that's not true. I worked as an architect for three months and never worked as a lawyer or got my, finished that last class for that law degree and took the bar because I didn't want to be a lawyer. So, but I, the pressure to go and say, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer, let's go do that because I'll make a lot of money. No, you know what I did? With a master's degree in architecture and three years of law school, I continued tending bar four nights a week. 
because it helped my writing. Willing to make that kind of decision, that kind of choice in your life? Well, I did. It's one of the reasons I'm still sitting here all these years later. It's because I always made that choice to having fun. Having fun. Because writing to me is a joy. I do not rewrite. I talked about that last year. I'm sure you can get the tape. You know, and, and the whole thing about, I don't rewrite. I write one draft clean, done. I never look at it again. Why would I look at it again? I know how it ends. <laughs> Why would I want to read it again? I read for writing. I read like I write like I read. I pick up another author's book, and I'm in for the read. Now, why would I want to know where that book's going? Why would I want to have an outline for that book before I read the book? Why would I want to do any of that shit? That's not fun. <laughs> Ooh, just makes, gives me the creeps. But everybody seems to think, because English teachers told you to do it, everybody thinks, seems to think you've got to have an outline, and hmm, you've got to rewrite. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry. So. That was number two, have fun. Use that as another of your posts. Sustainability, number one, have fun, number two. Here's where I'm gonna go against the trend for number three. Never write to market. <laughs> Sorry, the hell would you write to market for? Unless it's a market that you really, truly, truly love. I was a Star Trek fan. I used to go home from high school and early years of college to watch Star Trek on Friday night, because that's when it was aired. It only aired once. There was no such thing as recording back in the 60s to watch Star Trek. I didn't go out on dates. I didn't do anything else, because I had to watch that one stupid hour of television every Friday night. <laughs> okay? That's what kind of Star Trek fan I was. So when they offered me and said, Dean, you want to write a Star Trek novel? It was like, just, I mean, you, you ought to see me whimpering and begging. <laughs> oh, God, yes, I'll write a Star Trek novel because I was a hardcore fan. Now, if you get lucky enough to write into areas that you're a fan of, well, then go ahead and write to market. Perfectly fine. I mean, Chris and I watched the first Men in Black movie. Credits came up. We're sitting there. She turned to me and she said, you could have written that. Turns out I ended up writing a whole bunch of Men in Black. Okay. Yes, because... My stuff, I loved it, I wanted to do it. So be careful. Write what you love. That's the, that's the third point. Write what you love. If it happens to be to a hot market, good luck. God bless you. You're lucky. If it happens to be to some place that's a niche, have fun. Back to number two. Because that's sustainable. That is totally sustainable. All right, number four. Here's one that all beginning writers can't do. You just can't do it. Defend your work. Defend your work. Nobody touches my work. Nobody touches it. I have a copy editor who looks for misspelled words, and that's about it. I have a publisher that knows under threat of death, if she changes a comma, I will come up to Lincoln City and storm their offices, and they don't want me up there. Even though I own the company, they don't want me up there. <laughs> I live here in Vegas, and they're very happy I'm down here. Okay, And so you don't touch. Defend your work. Defend it against. But where you have to defend it is against yourself. Oh, I should have a book doctor read this. Oh, I should have, you know, I need three people in my workshop to read this, and then I'm going to take all their advice. Your artists, folks, learn now how to be an artist. Defend your work. You're not writing by committee unless you're working in Hollywood. Then they all write by committee. But in fiction publishing, which is what I'm talking about, and sustainable fiction publishing, you must write what you love and defend it against everybody. And that means, because I get these continuously in the workshops and stuff, they'll send me an assignment and go, oh, this isn't very good. I, I had trouble writing this. <laughs> Every so often, if it's a person I know can handle it, I'll just tear them, tear them apart. Why are they apologizing for your work? Why are you putting your own work down? I could not care, and nobody else on the planet cares how many copies you sold. Maybe your checkbook cares, maybe your bank account cares, but nobody else. So you don't say, well, I'm a new writer, and here's my first short story when you mail it off to a magazine. Why put your work down? Defend it. 
at against all comers, period, which also means never read reviews. There goes against the big trend here too, I've been hearing so far on the first day. Don't read reviews. Why would you ever read your, a review? The good ones will hurt you worse than the worst bad ones will because the good ones will go in. And then you'll go, oh God, I don't know if I can do that again. Oh, I don't know if I can make it that good again. <laughs> you're screwed. And there, goes, <laughs> and there goes two weeks of writing time because you're trying to clear somebody's nice words about you out. Okay? Just don't, don't. Be an artist, defend it. Set up a castle around yourself. If you have a good first reader, how I trust my first reader, I'll tell you, I have the best first reader that has ever walked down the road, Christine Catherine Rush. She's my first reader. She won a Hugo for her professional editing. She's also won Hugos for her writing. She reads my stuff. Every time I get done, I print it out, hand it to her, she reads it. And you know what I do? If she finds a typo or an antecedent problem, I fix it. It takes me about five minutes to go through a novel, maybe 10, to fix her corrections. That's it, I don't pay attention to anything else. Because I've been at this as long as she has. And it's my stuff. And guess what she does when I, I'm her first reader? She looks at any typo I find and maybe fixes it, maybe it's not a typo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what the hell do I know what she's doing sometimes? <laughs> so, defend your work. Number five. Believe in your work. Believe in it. Just simply, when you sit down to write, believe that whatever you do, no matter how stupid, no matter how much your, your mother's going to hate it or your spouse is going to hate it or whatever, whoever you have some sort of goal thing in mind, just believe that you did what you did and do the best you can. And then release it and go have more fun by doing the best you can on the next story and then do the best you can on the next one. If you know that it's the best you can do at that moment in time, then you are perfectly fine. Now, I have 40 years of writing behind me. Imagine if I didn't have that attitude. Oh, I, oh, I better go fix that story that I wrote 23 years ago. What would I be doing? I'd be living in the past. I never turn around and look back. That's why I never read my own stuff again. I only put in typo corrections from Chris, and that's it. Because I don't want to turn around and look back at anything, ever. It's very simple. If you just always are going to the next story. So when you learn something, like you learn something here about writing, or somebody mentions something, or you're reading a how to write book, or you're taking a class or something, and you go, oh, that's great. Apply it to the next story. Don't apply it to all the stuff in the back because that was the best you could do at that moment in time. Everything I have is a road marker through my 40 years of writing. Every published story, every published novel, you can look at it and say, hmm, is it gonna ruin my career if someone reads my first novel? No, I published it again. It came out of Warner Books, Warner Quest Star Books in 1988. I wrote it in 1987. It was my first published novel. It wasn't my first written novel. It was my first published novel. And I looked at this in paperback and went, well, that's kind of cool, because it was pre-computer days. I wrote it on a typewriter. And I went, oh, here. And I handed it to one of my employees and said, type this in word for word. Well, they called me one day and said, can, can we fix the typos that were in the Warner edition? And I said, yes. But don't fix anything else. I want every comma exactly like I wrote it in 1987, and it got through that book in 1987. I wanted it exactly the same. And I published it. It's out. It's called Laying the Music to Rest, if you want to read my very first novel. Um, so believe in your own work. Number six, dare to be bad. Dare to be bad. Nina Creaky Hoffman, an incredible fantasy writer, came up with this one day. And the the, what it is here is... We all have that critical voice that stops us. Oh, this is shit. What am I writing this for? You guys all recognize that voice. It stops you about page 100 on a novel. It stops you, you know, the third page of a short story. It's just standard. Oh, this has turned to crap. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know anything about this. I better quit. And you leave it unfinished. It takes more courage 
to write the next line, and then the next line, and then the next line, even if you don't know where it's going, and finish that story and put it out to readers. That takes real courage. You have to dare to fail once in a while. You have to dare to be bad. Will it ruin your careers? I hear so many beginning writers talk about. And poor, poor Lauren Coleman, bless his heart, he uh, uh, owns Catalyst Game Labs, got 25 or 30 novels out back in the day, and then he went to, into the gaming world because he just loved it, and he owns Catalyst Game Labs. Hell of a writer. Um, he teaches with us at the master class. And he, he was a young writer at a workshop that we were at. And he was kind of like, oh, what should I do? I just got an offer to write this game thing. And he had never sold a story, but he was going to write this part of a game back in 1985 or 6 or 7, somewhere near 7. And, you know, and it was just one of those things. And so he was kind of whining to me. And Chris was standing talking to somebody else. And Lauren said the, the deadliest words I've heard come out of a beginning writer's mouth. Well, I don't want to be known as. He said, I don't want to be known as a gaming writer. And my wife turned and said, well, you're not known as anything right now. <laughs> Doo! Turned back to her conversation. <laughs> Lauren has never forgotten that, because that's exactly right. And that's what most, of, most beginning writers worry about. I don't think, again, I was any exception to this. Because what was I worried about? Ruining my career, ruining. You know, that's just the dumbest damn thing to worry about because you don't have a career yet. <laughs> so why worry about ruin in it? Write what you love. Dare to be bad. It takes more courage to be bad and put it out on the market because you don't know. Authors are the worst judges of their own work. We can't judge our own stuff. I can't judge my work. I think everything I write is shit, so I put it out. <laughs> 23 million people have told me otherwise. <laughs> and I've made a lot of money at it. And I sell a lot of copies. I mean, I'm a New York Times bestseller, USA Today bestseller, all that shit that means stuff to other people. I don't care. It means nothing to me. I, my, I had an agent back in the day, and she called me. She said, you just hit the Times list with your such and such name. And I went, yeah, so? She said, well, you're going to be able to sell more copies. And I went, yeah, so? I don't care. I wasn't in it for, I was in it because I love to tell stories. You know that kid that we, a lot of you were where you just love to sit down and tell stories? I'm still that way at 69 years old. I just love to sit at my computer and make shit up. <laughs> and then people will pay me money for it. <laughs> Tough job. All right, number seven, Heinlein's rules. These are business rules. Heinlein did, put them out in 1946 or seven or something like that. And they are very simple rules, and they are unbelievably difficult. Most of you will not be able to stay on them. I fall off of, I call them, I call them imagine a giant horse. No saddle, no nothing. And you smear the dumb thing with the, the slickest substance possible, butter or something, very slick. And then you, somebody sits you up on top of that thing. And then the horse starts walking or galloping. You're going to fall off unless you're really good. Well, that's Heinlein's rules. You will fall off of Heinlein's rules. Heinlein's rules are simple. Number one, you must write. Well, that kills about, if there's a million, pe million writers out there who say they claim they want to be writers, that takes out 900,000 of them right there, rule one. Rule two, you must finish what you write. Well, out of the 100,000 that are left out of the million, that takes out another 90, because a lot of writers have that critical voice problem. They don't have the courage to be bad. They don't have the, the strength to be bad. Number three, you must not rewrite. Heinlein said this in 1947, folks. Most long-term professional writers that are my friends, none of us rewrite. Christine Catherine Rush does not rewrite. I don't rewrite. You know, there are people who have different methods that come up. Kevin Anderson rewrites because his first draft is a recording. Okay, so he has to type it in. Actually, I think he has someone type it in, and then he fixes it. Um, and so from there, number four, you must put it on the market. And number five, you must leave it on the market. <laughs> I, I, I tore some poor young writer a, a, a new body orifice 
one day because they said, oh, my story wasn't selling, so I took it down. And I'm like, you did what? Why would you do that? You would spend all the work to put it up. If it's not selling, well, look at your, look at your sales copy, which I guarantee sucks because nobody in this room knows how to write sales copy, and I will guarantee that. Number two, your cover might suck, might not be branded to genre correctly, that. But past that point, then look at your first paragraph, and if it's all people talking, then yeah, you got white heads talking in a white room. And so, you know, nobody's gonna read it. But if you don't have those three issues, just leave it there and eventually it will find its market. It really does work that way. If, if you, I, this poor writer only had three things and she took one of them down. And I'm like, why would you do that? You only have three things. Discoverability doesn't even begin to kick in until you got 20 or 30 major projects. You know, and then you can get enough people actually finding your stuff and buying your stuff. But now, do you know how many projects WMG Publishing has up that Chris or I wrote or edited? We have over 1,000 projects up. You wonder why I make a lot of money? Because you can find our stuff anywhere, everywhere around the world. We are wide. We are very wide. In fact, I love cash streams. I love multiple cash streams. So Heinlein's rules, five simple rules. You will not be able to stay on them. What rule do I fall off of? Number four. I hit the ground on number four. Like last year, Chris was very sick. We had to move her down here to Vegas to get her healthy. And I was still writing along the way and doing stuff. I wrote about 60 or 70 short stories in the last year, maybe 14 months. Are any of them out? Not a one of them. Not a one of them. Yeah, rule four. I fall off that sucker. And I, got, I have five full-time employees. All I have to do is send it to them. <laughs> I can't even do that. That's how slick that horse is. Number eight. Nobody cares. This should be, to you, the most freeing thing. You should put it over your computer. You should put it in your business office. You should put it, nobody cares. Nobody. Maybe your spouse, but they'll care more about the checkbook than they will about the writing. <laughs> nobody cares. Therefore, you have complete and total freedom to write what you want. Write anything you want, not be in a hurry, or be in a hurry if you want. Nobody cares. It truly is when you take that number eight and stick it on the wall, it is freeing. Because if you're there for the right reason, which is to be a storyteller, to be an entertainer, that's what we all are, we're entertainers. If you're sitting at that computer for the right reason, to have fun telling stories, then the fact that anybody's gonna read it or not just becomes secondary. And what will happen is if you write what you love and really, really get going at it and get into that, people will find you because that love comes through the words. It comes through the stories. It makes you a better storyteller. It really does work. And yeah, it might take a little longer. Some people may take a number of years. If you're not in this for the 10-year long haul or 20-year long haul, you're in the wrong profession. I mean, bottom line, if you're trying to make it by next year and you've quit a day job and you only got one year in the bank, go get a part-time job now because this is going to take some time to ramp up. And you see these people you know, saying, oh, I, I, look at my royalty report. I, I brought in $60,000 this month. When somebody says that to you, you say, how much did it cost you to get that 60000 I can tell you that there's numbers of commas in my income, and I know what it costs. I have five full-time employees, folks. I have an office building in Lincoln City that's seven and a half thousand square feet. But I can show you my income, my gross income, and it would blow you away. But I know what it costs to get that gross income. Now, my net income, after all the expenses are gone, still really high. <laughs> but, you know, me and the tax people know that, and actually me and, the cor me and my accountant know that because we don't pay much taxes because we understand corporations. All right, number nine, the last one. Calm down. 
take a deep breath. This will, there will be stuff going on next year. How many books do you want to write this next year? How much do you want to do? Comparing your success to others is deadly. Don't do it. Calm down. Don't compare to me. Don't compare to Chris. Don't compare to Michael or anybody else around here that's very successful. Don't. Just, just do your stuff because everybody in this room is an individual. You will track your own course. That's why I don't sit here and tell you, this is how I broke in. <laughs> because what difference would that make to any of you? I sat down and wrote a lot of short stories. Then I started writing novels. I started selling a whole bunch of short stories. I'm now in the position that I'm trying to license the Twilight Zone magazine. Why? Because, guess why? I used to sell short stories to the Twilight Zone magazine back in the 80s. A whole bunch of you didn't even know there was a Twilight Zone magazine, did you? But I sold to them. I would love to be the owner of the license and bring back out the Twilight Zone magazine and open it up. Wouldn't that be fun? But I don't have the license yet. I'm working with CBS to try to get this. Okay? This is called licensing. It's part of what we do. So, calm down. Take your time. And those are the nine things. And now I'm over to questions. How was that for timing? Ha <laughs> ah. ha! Drink water. So I was actually I yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, I was actually wondering how do you do some of the ghostwriting stuff for self-writing stuff for stuff. You're gonna have to say that again. I'm sorry. I was wondering how you actually get to be able to be an author for like Star Wars, Star Trek, you know, other people series. To media, you have a career. They come to you. Um, by and large, um, I had already sold novels. Um, at the time I uh, got offered the first Star Trek novel, I had been the publisher of Pulp House Publishing, which was the fifth largest science fiction, fantasy, and horror publisher in the nation for five straight years. And I was the publisher. Um, Chris and I had started that company. We learned a lot. We called it our master's degree because we lost so much money doing it. <laughs> um, but this was back in, in, we started it in 87. And we shut it down in 96, but we basically shut it down in 92. I went back to writing full time to pay off the debt. I paid off the debt of a publishing company by writing books. And I got my first um, Star Trek novel in 91, under contract in 91, uh, because they all knew me. I already had a career. And they knew I was a Star Trek fan. They knew I was a hardcore fan. So go to places where the editors are, where other writers are, talk to them. It's networking, just like what you guys are doing here. It's just networking but you've got to have a career under your belt. They'll, they won't even look at you unless you've got a lot of books out. They won't even look at you. And that's same with Men in Black. I mean, I'm sitting in Albuquerque, New Mexico next to a woman I didn't know at a table of editors because we were trying to get away from these horrid banquets that they were serving us. So all the guests went out you know, after we sat with our paper for a while. I'm sitting next to this woman, and the woman on the other side was one of my editors and a friend. And she said, oh, Stephanie, which happened to be this woman between us that I hadn't even been introduced to yet, she said, Dean would be perfect for that project you're looking for. So we're sitting at dinner in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I turn to that and say, what project is that? And she says, oh, I'm looking for someone to write Men in Black. I'm on my knees. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I got that one. It's all networking. I, I really don't mean to be snarky about this, but you, and you said defend your work on number four, and yet you mentioned part of your company is editing other people's work. I no. We edit, we edit things that we edit. <laughs> we oh. edit other people's work, but we don't publish other people's work outside of Pulp House Magazine and Fiction River Magazine. Oh. We, only, we only buy short stories. We do never publish anybody else's novels or anything else like oh, that. Oh, okay. I was a little confused. Yeah. yeah we, just, we, we have two magazines at WMG Publishing, Fiction River, which is Chris and I co-editing, but Chris is the lead person on that. Um, we get stuff, I mean, this year I think we had three in the year's best mysteries, in either in honorable mention or actually in the year's best mysteries. We get lots of, you know, honorable mentions and things out of the push cart and other places. Um, we get, um, Pulp House actually this year had one in the year's best mystery too in its second issue. Pulp House has only been going for seven issues so far. And so, and that's my baby. I'm the editor of Pulp House. I was the editor of Pulp House back in the eight, or early 90s, and now Pulp House Magazine is back under WMG ownership, so. So, uh, if you could talk for a little bit about uh, the attitude lessons you learned running a publishing house. I know you said you lot made a lot of mistakes, but okay. for somebody who's thinking about doing that now, don't. 
<laughs> a couple things about doing a publishing company. Number one, never do royalties. Play fat, pay flat fees. That's easy for you to say. Um, just flat fees. That's what we do with Fiction River and, and uh, Pulp House. We buy exactly what we need, you know, and nothing more. Um, I'll tell you a story real quick about the attitude on publishing and what I learned. We had signs over our doors in our Pulp House offices. When Chris, was, Chris was the executive editor, I was the publisher, and we had 14 employees there. It was a big operation, two-story building, and in Eugene, Oregon, of all places. And it was just, we had this over the top of our door. We're in this for the writing. We're in this to learn. That was all said and good, fine. Until one day, a writer by the name of Jack Chalker, some of you may have remember him, been gone a long time. I was doing a book for Jack that he had been a publisher way before he became a New York Times bestseller with his publishing company. And one of his writers turned in a book 18 years late. Now, the only writer that can get away with this on the entire planet was Harlan Ellison. <laughs> Harlan's a good friend of mine, was a good friend of mine. Sadly, he's gone. Jack's gone. But I'm publishing a Harlan Ellison book for Jack Chalker through Pulp House Publishing. I have two phones on my desk, the old style phones. Jack's on one line, Harlan's on the other. And I finally said, would you two bastards talk to each other? And I put the phones together. And then after that, I hung them both up, and I said, God damn writers. <laughs> and I heard myself say that. And I went, hmm, better learn some lessons from this. Yeah, because Jack and Harlan hated each other. This is why he turned it in 17 years late. OK, um, I'm a little nervous about this. I haven't really asked. OK, um, so if you It'll you. only hurt for a minute. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. All right. I'll be gentle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, if you're writing, I see, whenever I come up with a story, I, there are times where I get torn between two different ideas. Mm -hmm. And I often ask for other people's opinion. And normally, I noticed on your rules, as you, as you mentioned, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Or that. Nobody really does care. Yeah, but and other th and there's also something about. Well, I'll get right to the point. Mm -hmm. What if you're torn between two ideas and you have and you feel like you have to ask for the people's opinion? Is that okay? Do you have to trust your you gut? You can do anything you want. You can do anything you want. I'll tell you a story about what I did on something like that. All right. Um, way back when I was just starting off, I came up with this really cool idea because I was tending bar, mm -hmm. bar tending, tending bar, whatever, um, and I was there's a jukebox in this bar. And there was a song on this jukebox, and it took me back to a memory of an old girlfriend. Hmm. That was way before Chris. And, um, and so, you know, I thought, well, that's kind of cool. That was a little bit of time travel for that two and a half minutes of that 45 on that jukebox. It's all that does that to you. Yeah, and so I, basically what I did is I said, oh, that could be a good story about a jukebox that actually takes the person back to the memory and inside the younger body of the memory. They're my jukebox stories. I, and I wrote one. And I mailed it, because that's what I do. I write and mail. Even at that point, I was writing and mailing. And I kept thinking, I, I didn't do that well. I didn't, I didn't get what I wanted to get about that idea. So about two weeks later, I took the exact same idea, and I wrote another one. Now, the other story's still out in the mail, and it's going to stay out in the mail for a while, you know, getting bounced back and forth. I wrote the exact same story again. Exactly the same idea, exact same story. Same bar, same everything and mail that one off. And I still wasn't happy. So about four, five, six months later, I tried it again. Both same idea, just kind of came at it a different way, feeling like I'm still gonna tackle this idea. This is a big idea, I should tackle it. My skills are clearly not. The other two are bouncing around magazines. I get this thing, and guess who bought it? The Twilight Zone magazine. <laughs> that was the first one. The other two never got sold. I still doesn't have, I wasn't happy. Who gave a crap whether some editor liked it or not? I wasn't happy with the idea, what I did with the idea. So what I did is I did it again. I wrote the same idea again. This one you can find in FNSF magazine. It's called Jute Box Gifts. 
And I wrote about 10 or 12 more, but from that point, I finally said, okay, that's the idea I wanted to tell. And then I wrote a bunch more jukebox stories, and it, it's in my, one of, one of the novels in my Thunder Mountain series is a jukebox story, and things like that. And I've probably, got, I've had movie auctions. Jukebox gifts has probably made me somewhere around $25,000 now in movie options and things like that. But it was because I took that and said, I'm not happy with that, at, but I still mailed it. I wrote it again, not happy. Still mailed it, wrote it again. Make sense? Yeah, I was wondering what thoughts you might, or what advice you might give to writers about collaborating with other writers on projects. Well, I'm the, probably the last person to say, uh, I, hear, I have collaborated with half the planet at one point or another and written under more pen names than we can find yet. Although we're sort of at a calm point where the last six months we haven't come up with any more because I have a big list now in my office because we can never remember how many. And as soon as I feel comfortable that that's how many pen names I wrote under, I'll start saying the number, but it's a lot. Um, and some of those were collaborations. Some of them got outed, some of them didn't. Some of them, the partner had nothing to do with it. Chris and I had a, came up with, in our first few years together, we, we thought about collaborating and every one of them turned into a raucous fight. It was a very bad idea. <laughs> you guys get a sense of Christine Catherine Rush? Yeah. Compromise was not something that either one of us did. And so, are you almost, am I done? Let me finish this. What occurred was, <laughs> what occurred was we basically, I wrote the 100 page kind of rough draft and she filled in all the characters and, and, set, and setting. And that worked out good because I never looked at it. In fact, somebody handed me a book to sign and I went, God, I don't remember writing this. And Chris was sitting beside me at the signing table and she says, because you only wrote the outline. I'm like, oh yeah. That's <laughs> so it just, just make sure you have a, an agreement, a contract between the two people uh, for all contingencies. If you don't have a contract, you're an idiot on any kind of collaboration. Yes, sir. Thank you. Wait, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, guys. Oh. Blunt. Take a 15-minute break, and we'll see you for the keynote at 4.30.